If I couldn't do another $50 million order right now, what does that say? I did it in two days before the July 4th weekend. I know everybody. Uh, if I couldn't get it done right now, what does that say to the fragility of this entire system? Welcome back. I'm Nigel Spigel. And right now, if you look just there, you'll see something you rarely see in the wild. A silver Krugerrand and a silver Britannia, available at a very low premium. Right now, silver Britannia and silver Krugerrand are available at just 450 over spot. That's a premium lower than my shirt buttons. I just left it in the dryer too long. It... That's right, 2022 silver Krugerrand and Britannia, only 450 over spot. Call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's one 815 4237 Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always glad to have this returning guest. Andy Sheckman is the CEO of Miles Franklin Precious Metals. He joins us for this weekly market update today, which is Tuesday, August 16, 2022. Andy, thanks for coming back on. Good to be here. Well done. You Normally, normally we have to take that, take that uh, or tape that intro at least once or twice because we never remember what day it is so we we yeah uh, we, we usually don't remember what day it is well, I don't yeah my you, though because it's been that way for two years i don't even remember what day <laughs> that's it exactly right single day. that's exactly right uh anyway it the uh just glad to have you here uh one of the things i wanted to talk with you about if you could is not so much a market update it i guess you could you know, hold on let's let's rephrase that because part of any market is demand and demand comes from decisions made by individuals, whether they are at a small scale, whether they're at a large scale. That's part of what a market is, is buyers. And you've been telling us for over a month now about a rather remarkable, actually it was a record-sized $50 million gold and silver order from one particular buyer who had told you, if, I, if I'm correct, and told the broker that that was just an initial order and they, to expect that there would be more, and maybe even larger orders going forward. There has been ripple effects, I believe, from the fact that that news got out there about that individual, their decision, and the reasons behind what they did and the scope and scale of what they did that have really wakened, has opened people's eyes. I've had clients calling me who are either business owners or others saying, hey, I'm working on my with my partners to try to convince them that we've got to make our move and to do something uh, significant as well. And so it's... Part of that, I believe, contributing to that awakening among many people who have been either on the sidelines or kind of sleepwalking or on the fence or whatever, uh, to say, hmm, why did this this one in, in individual do this and, and why might I need to consider that? I know there's that uh, principle of psychology that's supposedly called the hundredth monkey uh, theory that says basically in a group of a population, if you get one or two or a small number of individuals doing a certain uh, behavior, they're just kind of, that's their thing. Nobody doesn't, doesn't affect the larger group. But when you get to a certain critical mass, there's something about psychology, something about groups and the way that we pick up on cues from each other, that when we start to see that there's a certain critical mass forming a, a, a movement, uh, that it becomes something that comes through our reticular activating system and actually gets us to notice it and affects our thinking about what we might maybe should be doing. Uh, it's absolutely true. And uh, wanted to know if there's any additional takeaways, any additional insights that you've been gleaning from that one sale that, that happened. Uh, and I guess it's not just happened, it's, it's ongoing as, as you're able to keep getting the inventory in to fulfill uh, that order. But what else have you learned, uh, thought of because of it? You know, Dunnigan, it's really, I'm glad you asked me that question. Um, my challenge in life is to let my brain quiet down. And I have a very difficult time doing that. Um, I often find myself laying in bed going over what had happened the day before or that day and trying to think about, you know, um, certain things and wonder if I answered the questions the right way. I find myself doing this all the time. Um, it's difficult to fall asleep, but I often do my best thinking. And sometimes I jump right out of bed 
and uh, write stuff down. Other times I wake up with clarity. Um, and so I was asked a question uh, recently, and the question was, looking at you've been talking about buying gold and silver now for on YouTube for a few years. And, and the question that was asked of me is, at what point or what level do I sell my gold and silver? And I thought, you know, this is an, an excellent question. It's an important one, too. And, you know, people out there who know me from coming into their living room multiple times per week, um, this may not surprise them, my answer, but I, I'd like to, to try and quantify the answer, qualify it as well, because um, I think it's important. I think it's important. I think now I don't know that this one particular lady, because I re I related it, <clears throat> excuse me, to this order. Uh, I thought about her motivation. When would she sell it? Um, why would she sell it? And my feeling is that, and I think she feels this way, don't know it, but I would guess that she never will sell her gold and silver, or if she owned platinum for that matter, ever. I think that she views these metals as an integral part of her estate and her net wealth. And I don't think she cares what the current price is because I think she understands that gold represents unencumbered wealth. I'm gonna give you an example from her standpoint. Let's call her a rich woman uh, because she is. Um, and you know, let's also remember that she didn't get rich by being stupid. Um, this woman holds, let's call it 12,000 ounces of gold for the sake of math. And today her, her holdings are worth $23 million. Um, she's rich, um, no question about it. But let's pretend for a moment that gold declines to $700 an ounce. Now, before I finish this, I, I want to say I'm giving the answer to this question from the perspective of a wealthy individual, a very wealthy individual who I think there are a lot of wealthy individuals out there who will have an awakening at some point. Uh, and that awakening will come as markets start to find equilibrium with interest rates or if the dollar, as we've talked about, starts to be globally forsaken, as it appears that it is. And the um, response to that, the market's response to that, I think, will be uh, negative to traditional forms of investment. And at some point, people will wake up. So in any case... This is the way that I think a wealthy person, a rich person, would look at this. I can't help interrupting to, to chime in and just be a little um, gadfly for you. When you said people will wake up and, and stop being as uh, following traditional forms of investment, I would argue that uh, the modern monetary structures, the modern financial derivatives and, and all of that that comes from it is not traditional what we've gotten used to over the past couple of generations of thinking of as things to invest in are not traditional investments, uh, whereas this is actually getting back to tradition. Good point. No, I like that. And I like that. And you know what they, you know, I mean, I think, uh, um, you know, everything comes full circle. So I like that. Um, so today her, her holdings are worth 23 million in gold. And I'm just going to forget about silver for a moment. We're just going to talk about gold because it's easier for the sake of math. So let's pretend that gold declines to a price of $700, and that's a pretty big drop, right? Uh, during, let's call it a crushing world deflation where bankruptcies rule and the price of everything that has debt against it, think counterparty risk, collapses. Um, at this point, this rich woman is holding $8.4 million worth of gold. Now, this is just based on spot. The lady is still very rich. Uh, next comes runaway inflation after this deflationary collapse as the Fed comes in and tries to save the day with a wide open, you know, spigot of money and, and reaccommodating and, and pushing interest rates down again, you know, right, right out of their playbook. And gold runs up to twenty five hundred dollars an ounce. And she now owns thirty million dollars worth of gold um, is almost embarrassingly rich, at least in terms of her neighbors, let's say. Um, the point I want to get across is that in holding 12,000 ounces of gold, this lady will always be rich, no matter what. And let's call it shades of rich, depending upon the economy. So 
I would argue that this rich woman isn't trying to beat or out trade the gold market. She holds gold and silver as as eternal wealth um, and an eternal store of wealth. And I and I and I think that's through good times and bad. Now, the only argument I thought about that would invalidate this argument is that gold actually becomes a worthless barbaric relic that we've often heard people say it's a barbaric relic. Never understood that. Um, and suddenly nobody wants gold. And I thought about that for a minute and I came back saying, well, this isn't a valid, ar a valid argument because 5,000 years of history say that that argument is wrong. And, and I think, you know, gold is etched into the DNA of mankind. There's never been an instance since pre-biblical times where men, and in this case, women, didn't lust after gold. And so in laying in bed before I fell asleep last night, it just dawned on me that you can learn from the wealthy or from this rich woman. And never mind today's price of gold. Just mind how many ounces you own. And I think that's really the key takeaway here is that when you own precious metals, I often talk about it as being wealth. It, it's not to get wealthy. And I tried to find a way to, using mathematics, show you this. Now, it's it's a much bigger uh, equation when you're talking 12,000 ounces of gold. But I want people to understand it from a person of wealth, the way that they would be looking at this. And there are very wealthy people out there where $20 million isn't that big of a deal. I mean, there are basketball players out there making $40 million a year in the NBA. Uh, so that there will be a percentage of people who make this transition and 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 wake up to, to what gold and silver are. And so I think that these people will hold on to their metal forever, as long as they possibly can, and pass it on to their children in an immutable fashion. Um, and I, I think that's really the takeaway here is that once there is this awakening, and I think we're getting closer to it, and this lady is is validation of that, um, I truly do believe that, and this is again goes to my point of talking about supply being a real issue moving down the road because it's sticky. People don't want to relinquish their gold and silver. They want to pass it on to their family. They're wealthy in other ways, the wealthy. And this is just a way to preserve a portion of their wealth. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, you know, we've been talking about um, the, the U.S. Mint curtailing production of gold the second half of the year. I, I looked at it. They only made 30,000 gold eagles in the month of July. I mean, if you go back a few months, they're making over 100,000. So I was also told that, you know, the Mint believes they have enough blanks to last till November, but they have curtailed production. So they used to do allocations every week. Now they're doing every other week. And those allocations have greatly been reduced. So you can see this trend, at least from the standpoint of the U.S. Mint, I just wanted to pick up, you know, this thread that we've talked about for quite some time about dwindling supply. Ultimately, the U.S. Mint is not making it any easier to accumulate metal. And in looking at their production numbers, uh, 30,000 gold eagles, I mean, that's woefully under under production uh, from what is being demanded here globally. And you can see that in premiums that have gone up 100 bucks since I brought this up on your show saying my next prediction is that gold eagles take off like this too. My only question is, that, do they become like the silver eagles? I'm not sure, but um, you put it all together and you have a, a growing awakening, a very large money looking to shelter their, um, their, their wealth. And, you know, I went out to dinner the other night here in Florida with um, one of the gentlemen who helped me fill this order. And uh, he said to me, Andy, you couldn't do this order right now to save your life. Not even a chance. There is no way that you could do this order right now without going deep into 2023, like first quarter deep. So um, I want people to think about that for a second. You know, I've been saying for a very long time and got a lot of heat for it on a lot of channels. He's talking his book, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm not. If I couldn't do another $50 million order right now. What does that say? I did it in two days before the July 4th weekend. I know everybody. Uh, if I couldn't get it done right now, what does that say to the fragility of this entire system? You and I were talking just the other day about 
uh, an order not even close to this size, but significant enough to where, you know, we were wondering, could it disrupt our inventory here at Miles Franklin? The answer is yes. And so the point I'm getting at, then again, and I don't know why I decided to also dovetail what we were talking about here to this, because they're connected. Uh, and I think that uh, people need to understand that it won't take but a few very wealthy men and women like this who look to preserve, who look to hold money and preserve their wealth, no matter what happens to the gold and silver price, because it is wealth. Um, you know, you can see that it's going to be more and more challenging for Johnny come lately's or Jenny comes lately. And uh, this is one of these deals where uh, I, I wish I could find a way to convey to people that, you know, there's more to the equation than just the price. And price is a tool of misdirection. And this is one of the reasons why I think part of my success in accumulating metal goes all the way back to the lesson that my dad taught me day one when I started at Miles Franklin in, in 19, uh, what was that already? 1989, 1990. Um, buy something every two weeks. Now, I know everyone can't do that, but the idea of cost averaging, you know, I've done it every two weeks for 23 years or 33 years. Everyone can't do that. But the idea of cost averaging, getting in, dipping your toe and stop waiting for that one big drop in gold. Stop waiting to do everything at once. Just buy when you can. Pay yourself first because we're going to wake up at one point and the, the big money is going to be terrified. I really do believe that there will come a moment where the big money becomes terrified of being in what is considered conventional investing. And if a very small percentage of those people come out looking for uh, a refuge in, in metals, it won't take but just a small push in this very fragile uh, um, supply chain infrastructure to render everything uh, unobtainium. And I, and I do think that that's on, on, on the table. So um, anyways, it was just a little thought experiment. And I, I walked away from it all saying she won't ever sell it. I believe she will hold it and pass it on to her family because she realizes it is rich, uh, wealth and she'll be rich no matter what gold and silver do. If you own enough, you'll always be wealthy in any in any eventuality. And I, and I think that's really the point I'd like to get across. Not everyone can buy 50 million, but look, if you have a couple hundred thousand dollars worth, maybe you, you think you're rich. Maybe you are for the, your standard of living. The point of it is, is that when you reach that level, maybe it's a few thousand dollars worth for you, whatever it is, when you reach that level, it's not about the value. It's about the number of ounces and it's about what it represents. Um, and there is no better way if you don't need it to pass it on to your family. So I hope that helps some people who are wondering, should I sell it? When should I sell it? When will she sell it? What's her exit strategy? And I actually think her exit strategy is to when she exits to leave it for her family or for uh, a charity or whoever is important to her passing on immutable wealth uh, that I think is, um, you know, lasted the test of time. So anyways, I'm off my soapbox. Happy to hear what you have to say about that. Well, it's interesting because this theme that you're, that you're poking at here about the, the reality of the nature of real money is so important. And it came out later this week, we're going to have Alistair McLeod's interview coming out. He's going to talk about that. Uh, Rafi Farber, who we had on for the first time, is going to be co coming out and talking about that. And the idea is that people think of wrongly when they think of acquiring something and then dumping it, you know, basically flipping it uh, to make a profit in, in, in dollars or something rather than, and I even had a client ask me who was purchasing small amounts and getting started saying, yeah, but how, how do you get rid of it when the time comes? How do you get rid of it? <laughs> and you can't just take it to the store and buy something like you can now with dollars or whatever. This idea of not yet waking up to the fact that Precious metals are money, you know, gold and silver are money. So most people don't wake up in the morning asking themselves, how do I get rid of money? How do I get rid of it? I got to get rid of it. Um, if it's real money, you don't want to get rid of it. You know, as times get tough or whatever happens, you hold on to real things. So uh, it's going to be an interesting, it's going to be an interesting uh, 
time going forward for all of us. And, and you and I have both been trying very hard here to reach as many people as we possibly can to get that word out, to pretty wake up the sleepwalking uh, people who, ha- who are subject to harm from a system that is going to fail. And uh, when it does, uh, they'll be much uh, better off if they have something that's real. Uh, So Alistair talks about that, and and it echoes what you're saying about the very wealthy. um, And so for for the last several, several decades, uh, we have basically the whole Western world has been uh, creating, you know, not only just the the stock market and the bond market and then the derivatives and the derivatives above those. um, And this whole complex, he says, is going to come tumbling down and all of that um, is going to be very sharply focused on what's real and that's commodities and and sound money and the, whereas you have some of the Asian countries this came out from your talk from the rural symposium the Russia and China notably uh, some of the most powerful there uh, who are taking a very different approach and making sure that they are well stocked with gold for one and real things that that people need like oil gas fertilizer uh, rare earth metals all kinds of things like that so strategic commodities yeah and that's what zoltan pozar said the repo market expert that we've now entered uh, Bretton woods three a system that will be based upon commodities rather than debt instruments and i completely and totally agree and i hope if Fallister is watching or you'll tell him he's one of my top two or three favorites um out there i, I don't miss anything that he says so i'll be looking forward to seeing that premiere and um, and Rafi Farber is another brilliant guy who does a masterful job on showing us what's coming in and out of COMEX. What he's been talking about lately is equally as fascinating. He's been talking about the massive drawdown of metal, uh, which is something I've been talking about for a few years. Um, the deliveries that have happened in silver, I think over 250 million ounces were delivered in silver just the other day off the London Metals Exchange, that an extraordinary amount of gold is coming off the COMEX. In fact, I think what Rafi said was that uh, in one of the interviews I just caught of his, that the July drawdowns in uh, COMEX gold are at the fastest pace in the history of the COMEX. Uh, We talked about SLV and um, 100 million ounces have been taken out of it um, in a very short period of time by by the commercial banks. So once again, you're seeing, and you you can merge that with record um, insider selling of, of stocks where the insiders are selling on any sign of strength. So you put it together, you have insiders leaving the stock market on signs of strength, and you have massive drawdowns in inventory on not only the LME, but also the COMEX, and at the same time, backdooring out of SLV and GLV, which are the commercial banks. They're the ones doing that. So sophisticated money, big money, which is kind of the theme here, uh, and I've been saying forever, they use the price as a tool of misdirection, and they are exiting out of these uh, centers of of um, of inventory uh, and removing counterparty risk. And you don't have to be a genius to take a step back and say, why the hell would they do that? You know, why? What's the reason? Well, obviously, they feel that counterparty risk is, is a problem. Obviously, they feel leaving it on the exchanges is a problem. Why did the central banks all repatriate their gold? before it was reclassified tier one, this thread, this common thread that keeps on growing, it's very illuminating. And it all comes back to the fact that, well, why don't people get it? Well, people don't get it because the price has not taken off. Well, why hasn't the price taken off? Because the price is set on the COMEX and it's fraudulently set. And the prices has nothing to do with physical demand. And that's the part that are, is really hard for people to wrap their heads around. Most people say, I don't care what you say, Andy, the price hasn't done anything. Yeah, you're right. It hasn't. And the markets are manipulated until they're not. But if it were just manipulated, that's one thing. It's hard to say, well, when does the manipulation end? OK, why is the, the mark? Why are the markets being drained of their physical metal by the most sophisticated, well-funded, well-informed traders on the planet? You look at at what the others have been doing, taking massive amounts of gold off of COMEX. We've talked about this, this group, the others, huge amounts off of COMEX. So you got the sovereign wealth funds and the family offices draining COMEX. You got the commercial banks draining SLV, GLD, the London Metals Exchange and COMEX. I mean, it's happening 
right in front of you. And and this is why people don't get it, because they're not paying attention. How would they? Why would they? You got to watch a guy like Rafi or you have to read the 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 commit uh, the commitment of traders report, which is mind blurring. And then at the same time, you look at what's going on with the U.S. Mint, limiting the ability for the average Joe and Jane to do the exact same thing. There's something bigger at play here, Dunnigan, and that's just the bottom line. And that, you know, I think about this every Sunday night when I have to start preparing for what I'm going to talk to you and others about all week. And it's hard to keep going down this same road, this same narrative. And I, I do take... Um, comfort in the fact that a lot of the things that I've been talking about seem to keep evolving, allowing me to continue this this thread, this narrative. And I, I want everyone to know that I hope I'm wrong. I mean, if I'm wrong, I apologize if people uh, trusted me to prepare for what I see coming. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. And I guess we'll have to see what you said to me offline here that Alistair was talking a lot about the things that I've been talking about certainly makes me feel a little bit more confident in that he's as bright of a mind as as there is in this industry. But I don't think you have to be a a world class economist like he is in order to see this. If you take a step back and are honest with yourself and look at the, the chain of events that keeps happening under one umbrella called de-dollarization. And if you look closely enough, go back and listen to the to the, to the year's worth of interviews you and I have done, and every single time I say the same thing about de-dollarization, about misdirection, about metal being drained off the exchanges, about metal or, 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 or agreements being struck, usurping the dollar, it's all happening and it's accelerating at in pace. And then you throw into the mix 40-year high inflation, a war, a, a, a rating of, 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 a, of a former president when Lord knows there are many other houses that should have been rated long before his, um, and on and on and on, things that just make you shake your head. Um, I don't know. It's just something's going on. Something is at foot. And I think now more than ever, um, maybe even people get it. They're starting to get it when they feel that their government is turning against them, hiring 85,000 new IRS officials um, at the same time a former president's home is raided. I mean, the, the whole thing just is starting to become disconcerting. And even if you can't articulate what it is that's bothering you, I think people feel that something isn't right. Now, maybe not the way that we do or your listeners do, because we've been preaching this stuff for a long time. But you know, um, when this awakening happens and whatever the fuse is that lights it, I think that we're running out of time because like we talked about offline this weekend, one very large order will blow up my inventory. There's five or six companies like me in the country. So five, 10 wealthy people. What happens to everything in this country? Gone. Bye bye. And then what? Then you're into 2023 before you get product. That's true. That's real. And you've been a representative of my company long enough to know I'm being sincere. And because you see all the inventory, we have a lot, but it doesn't, it, it, it keeps disappearing. We keep trying to refill it. Anyways, again, down the rabbit hole, but I just want you to know that um, I think things are starting to accelerate. And and I think, I think that it, it's going to become clearer to more and more people um, as time rolls on, because it, there is an appearance of acceleration of a lot of these events uh, globally and here domestically. And I completely understand what you said when you say you hope you're wrong, because there's scant comfort that comes when you see the direction that things are, in fact, playing out the way that you and I have been cautioning people for years uh, is likely, because it means that most people, you know, we have... 72,000 subscribers on YouTube, quite a few on Brighton, Rumble, SoundCloud, that sort of thing. But we're just we're just a tiny sliver of a toenail, uh, you know, as far as how many people we can actually reach. And there's so many people who are still in harm's way. And so that's why it doesn't feel good when you when you hear that happening, because, you know, it's against what is right. And it's going to be people are going to get hurt and uh, trying to find ways to help encourage people to take care of 
take care of their families, to maintain their privacy, their freedom, uh, their ability to survive and thrive uh, going forward. But you see, we see um, tough times ahead, and how do we how do we prepare to do the best and to be able to uh, weather that as much as possible? I just, that's why I have such great. Um admiration for you and respect and and i'm just so happy to be associated with you because that oozes from you and yeah we all want to make a living we all want to pay our bills we all want to to have money to, for our family but i think your motivation like mine is very pure and it's one of the reasons that i take great pride in our relationship and i i hope i hope that we're helping people uh i think we are and um you know, look, if we're wrong, the worst thing that happened is you've prepared in many ways, uh, not just financially, with all the tutelage that you've given over the years for for being prepared. Um, and, you know, like this wealthy person, I believe she'll never sell her metal. It will be a lasting legacy to pass on to future generations. So if we're wrong, so be it. You passed wealth on to your family in a form that has been wealth for 5,000 years and will continue to be wealth long after we're gone. And if we're right, it may be the most important thing that, that people have ever done. And I take a little bit of pride uh, in, in and helps me sleep at night when I finally am able to close my eyes and shut my mind off that maybe I've helped just a few people. And Thanks for helping me get the word out. I appreciate it. Yeah, I it, it's it's uh, I didn't I don't tell you every time we get a call from a client during the week who says you know they're they're thanking us, uh, myself and my sons, and they mention you uh, for for having persisted and persisted and persisted at at trying to get the 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 word out so that people can be aware and prepared. And they mention, you know, what a meaningful impact this can make on families. And, and I've told before about my uh, good uh, friend from my former career, whose family in India, the father, the father, of the patriarch of the family passed away, leaving his wife a widow and, and children. But their family got by for two generations uh, until the grandkids could be, get professional careers and become, you know, doctors and lawyers and that kind of thing, living out of the gold savings in their little safe in the in the house they used that in in minute quantities to purchase the food that they needed to pay their fuel bills and to pay their you know taxes and that kind of stuff and uh, they their families their family pulled through for two generations on their their physical savings um so anyway you can it can really be a game changer uh in families uh so turning the page chapter two is weekly market uh, special uh, so what have you got for us uh, this week that people should be aware of and avail themselves of? Yeah, we still have the 2022 uh, Britannias, uh, UK Britannias, in uh, tubes of 25 and boxes of 500, uh, along with, and those are from last week, we're going to continue them this week and add to it the 2022 Krugerrand, same size uh, tubes of 25, boxes of 500 in stock, ready for immediate delivery at $4.50 over the price of silver for both of them. I am fairly confident that's the best price in the country uh, uh, for both. And uh, those are available again for immediate delivery. Here again, you know, as a U.S. Mint authorized reseller, I wish I could tell people to buy some Silver Eagles, but this week they're priced at over $13 a coin. It's just too darn expensive. So this being two of the major six mints of the world, the South African Mint and the United Kingdom Mint, sealed mint boxes, uh, it's a heck of a value. Again, premiums at 450 are much higher than they were my entire career, but yet probably lower than I've sold them for or anyone sold them for for the past two years. So good value as it relates to uh, anything over the last two years for a sovereign mint brand new coin. I guess the flip side of the high premiums on the U.S. Silver Eagles, we might want to mention because we did mention this uh, two weeks ago. In fact, we were at the airport coming home from the from the rule symposium and I put out a quick bulletin. It's like, guys, I've never seen uh, buyback premiums this high. So if people want to sell us Silver Eagles uh, in swap for gold or swap for some other form of silver uh, on a swap right now, we're paying ten dollars over per Silver Eagle for random years or 1050 over for 2022s on a swap. Uh, it'll be slightly less for a cash out buyback, but still those are remarkably high premiums for, uh, for Silver Eagles. Yes. 
Are you looking at the our wholesale sheet by chance? What's the buyback on the five ounce America the Beautiful? I think it's even higher. Eleven dollars per ounce over spot. Yeah. Eleven bucks. So there you go. Look, these, you know, look. Uh, if if I had my druthers and and premium and price weren't an issue, I would say buy Eagles in America the Beautiful. But if you want to talk about a real value, when I look at every single successful large trade that I've done where I get all my clients together and say, you need to do this right now. They've always centered around price anomalies. Now I'm not saying this is an anomaly moving forward, but if you look at it in relation to everything I've seen over 30 years, this is four feet of snow in my backyard here in Delray beach here in, in August. I mean, and like I always say, I'm not going to call my dad and say, send me my snowmobiles that are in your garage. If I really wanted to believe that this wasn't an anomaly, I'd go snowmobiling up and down the golf course. It's not going to happen. Point I'm getting at is that to see these premiums where they are, the buyback at 11 bucks on a five ounce American, the beautiful, that's $55 over its melt value, $11 an ounce, where you can buy a kilo bar for somewhere around three bucks an ounce or a hundred ounce bar. So, you know, do the math. Uh, uh, you, you're, it does make sense. Um, if people don't want to do it, that's fine. But if you're looking for a way to capture that premium and put it into real ounces, which is arguably the right thing to do, uh, you're right. I, I too have never seen premiums as high as they are on the American made coins. So, and if the mint continues down the path, they'll only go higher, but, uh, wouldn't be a bad idea to consider if you have enough to make it worth your while, uh, you know, trading. Look, just as it is right now, you're talking $3,500 above um, a, a kilo bar purchase in a mint box. In other words, if you if you realize that the kilos are roughly three and you're getting 10 on the, that's a $7 spread on 500 ounces. It's 3,500 bucks worth of silver. So figure you're getting, uh, what, another... 150 ounces or what have you. I'm just doing the math off the top of my head, something like that. But it's significant per mint box. So, you know, you have 10 mint boxes. You walk with 1,500 extra ounces or three extra mint boxes worth of silver. Is it worth it? I think it is. But anyways, food for thought. Yeah. In fact, that also helps to answer a rather disgruntled comment that was put by a viewer uh, midweek. And I replied as as thoroughly as I, as I could, I think. And they were saying, I'm just frustrated that we can't purchase uh, coins or silver coins at the price of silver as you guys can from the mint. And it's like, uh, I think there's a misunderstanding here because when, when, when the reality of the market is that we're able to buy back American silver eagles on a swaps at $10 over uh, per ounce over spot, uh, I think that shows that we're not, we're not buying them at the price of silver, not from the mint, not from anybody. So that's the, it, it's, it's a misunderstanding. Uh, I think that's a, it's a very understandable. Uh, misunderstanding people have about where premiums come from. They assume it's just price gouging by the final uh, sellers, but it, that's not the case. It's that the whole market, that is the price at which these are changing hands among willing buyers and willing sellers. And it's higher than the paper spot price for ver a variety of reasons. Yeah, price gouging would be offering spot or a buck or two over for the American Eagles, not 10. And, you know, before you made that announcement, we were at 1075. So I'm assuming there are people who are taking advantage of that. So the premiums, the more supply, the premium comes down a little bit. But, you know, look, we've talked about this before. There are a handful of primary mint distributors. They're the ones that are jacking up the premium. And I don't blame them. I don't because they don't know where their next lunch is coming from. Like I said, the mint only made 30,000 gold eagles in the month of July or thereabouts. So, you know, if if there's six or seven distributors, so each one of them get four or 5,000 gold coins, um, you know, as a primary distributor. Uh, and how many dealers like myself work with the primary distributors? And that's globally. So, I mean, you know, gold eagles and silver eagles are sold all around the globe, not just here in North America. When you do the math and spread it out over the supply chain, there's not a lot of supply. And so they don't know where it's coming from. The fact that they're bidding huge premiums also tells you it's real. It's sincere. Yeah, they're making money on one end. But when they sell out a product, you know, prime example, the mint out of nowhere 
curtailed production of gold by 50%. Didn't there was no advance warning? Bang, done. So why that's why premiums on gold went up on gold eagles because here again you got all this demand. Everyone likes gold eagles, and supply just got cut in half. And actually, if you look at it, it's more like it was cut by two thirds. Um, so I don't blame them as long as they continue to have super high bid prices. Now that spread between 10 and 13, it's a pretty big spread. Yeah, but let's look at this big client of mine who bought 900,000. If she wants to sell me 100,000, I have a million dollars in premium I can't hedge. I have to have a big enough spread there to give me a little bit of cushion. So please understand that, you know, nothing sells for spot. Nothing, not even a thousand ounce silver bar sells for spot. There's the cost of production and distribution and advertising and 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 shipping and all of these things before we even touch it. So there is a misconception. I get it. But uh, I will say this, that this industry is amongst all industries is as small of a gross margin industry as you'll ever find. Um you know, where if you don't do a whole bunch of volume, you're not going to be uberly successful. So to that person, I appreciate what is a logical um, thought. But please understand that if price gouging were something that anyone in this industry did, uh, their their days would be numbered. And uh, all of us major companies, four or five or six of us that are out there very visible, all have been around long enough to understand that that is not the key to success. Premiums are real on the on the sell side, but also on the buyback side, and and that's really to what you're saying. And I hope that hope that eases the concern of these people. Because one last point, you know, let's look at it the way that it was prior to as I've talked about. That person called me on Thanksgiving of 2019. I would have sold them at 329 over Silver Eagles and bought them back at 265 over. Four months later, in March or April 2020, after the pandemic hits, we're buying them back at 10, 11 bucks over. So that's the point, is that premiums have a, a mind and a life all of their own based upon supply and demand or lack there of either of those two catalysts. So anyways, worth mentioning time and time again, people understand that there's no price gouging going on. In fact, quite to the contrary, we're trying to be the most competitive company in America, or one of the most anyways. Look at look at what we're selling points for versus everyone else. Just understand that for those that actually do want to sell back, our bid prices will be amongst the very best in, in North America at the same time. Well, Andy, as always, thank you for joining us on behalf of all of our viewers here in Liberty and Finance for these weekly market updates. I know that these were supposed to be short and this one wasn't, but I think there was a lot to talk about and <laughs> appreciate you hanging with us and uh, look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday for the next weekly market update. Always looking forward to it. Have a great rest of your week to you and everyone out there. And thanks again, Dunnigan. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, 
call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.